Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Professor Simon Haynes, who is the CEO of the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization, and he's based in Sydney. Simon, welcome to Liberalism in Question. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we're, we're exploring issues to do with liberalism and its viability and its challenges. Are you someone who believes in liberalism as a social and political philosophy? Well, I'm certainly somebody who believes in its influence and its its continuing power and relevance. Um, it, it, I often think it's best understood through its genesis, through its origins, Rob. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how... Um, how historical you really want me to be. But I, I, here's the thing, here's the thing that's interesting. You look in the OED, which as a literary scholar is always my first point of reference. And you, I don't know whether you've done this for your show, but if you look at the first citation of the word liberalism, so right back to the very first one, the OED always gives you a historical account. I, 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 you've embarrassed me, I've not done that obvious thing. I'm well, please go on, Simon. Shame on you, shame on you, no, no, no just kidding. So, in fact, it's, it's 1816, which is quite an interesting um, thing. That's later than I thought, actually. Yeah, okay. Well, let's, so, and I'll tell you what it says. This is from an article that appeared in the London Morning Chronicle in January of 1816. And it says, this is the citation, the King of Spain condemned 15 persons accused of the crime of liberalism, the crime of liberalism, to hard labor, banishment, etc. So, so that's an interesting thing because obviously in 1816, Spain was an absolutist monarchy and liberalism was regarded as a dangerous, radical, um, um, anti-monarchical, anti-absolutist movement. And the only way to treat liberals was to banish them or send them to jail and commit them to hard labor. Now that's an interesting thing. Um, um, You know, I can think of some contexts even today where liberals might be condemned to banishment and hard labour, but that's the first citation. And and, um, it it has a lot to do with the historical circumstances in which liberalism arose, as you you just implied. Um, In fact, liberalism and conservatism and socialism were all isms that appeared around about the same time between the end of the... Napoleonic War and the Great Reform Bill in the early 1800s. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Um, so you tend to find them arising as a kind of trio of isms, which are somewhat in opposition to each other. And and the interesting thing is, uh, well, I mean, you know, it depends how far back you want me to take you. The idea of a liberal political philosophy and a liberal practice predates the use of the word liberalism. And as you'd know very well, I'm sure other contributors to your show would have said this, that, um, uh, that, that, that the, liberal, um, the, the liberal worldview, the liberal position, begins really with John Locke. Yes, I was going to say um, John Locke, yes. Yeah, which, which, is, which is, you know, a hundred and odd years earlier in the 1680s. And, and Locke's book, the, the, two treati- the Two Treatises of Government, particularly the second of the two, uh, is often regarded as the kind of original fount of, of liberalism. And Locke, it, an interesting thing about liberalism, and maybe this is still relevant today, is that it's both a political philosophy and a practice. Yes. And if you compare it with conservatism on the one hand and socialism on the other hand, it's different from both of those because conservatism tends to put the weight much more on the practice. You tend, you tend I mean, there are exceptions, but you tend not to have kind of careful articulations of conservative political philosophy. In you fact, tend conservatives, to, conservatives tend to be anxious about too, too yeah. rational. Too rationalists. Yes, too yeah, rational, exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Uh, and they tend to, in this context, they would put much more importance on constitutional history, on yes. Magna Carta, on the role of the House of Commons, rather than an articulated philosophy. Whereas on the other hand, socialism... Uh, is, if anything, more theorised than yes. liberalism at the other extreme. So liberalism is kind of, kind of in the middle, and this has a lot to do with John Locke and the, and the circumstances when liberalism arose, which was just after the Restoration, 
uh, or at least sometime after the Restoration, at the time of what used to be called the Glorious Revolution, although it wasn't that glorious and it wasn't really a revolution. Um, but but it was, as, as you'd know, it was when um, James II basically rather furtively slunk out of England via Kent, I believe, um, it having been made clear to him that he was no longer welcome. And, and that, was, um, that, was, that was done because there was, uh, there was alarm either about his Catholicism or about his tendency to revert to an absolutist divine mm. conception of monarchy. And so that was the Glorious Revolution. And Locke, with Locke's great patron was Anthony Ashley, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, who was by far the greatest Whig statesman of the era. Uh, and Locke worked for him essentially as his secretary um, and, and also as kind of the articulator of Shaftesbury's practice. And Shaftesbury was the great Whig, the first great Whig, and Whigs evolved eventually after many changes over the next 100 years or so or less than 100 years into something like a Liberal Party uh, in the early 19th century. But the foundation was in the resistance to absolutism. That's where Locke's great contribution, as you would know, in the, um, in the second treatise, and I actually I dug out my copy and I'll just read it to you. Men being, as has been said by nature, so this is the 1680s, long yeah. time before Rousseau and the French Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, before Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, these, these things we hold to be self-evident that all people are, you know, all men are created free, blah, blah, blah. Locke, 100 years before this, is saying um, men, as has been said by nature, all free, equal, and independent. No one can be put out of this estate and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. So you've got it all there, free, equal, and then the other key thing about the foundations of liberalism is the idea of government by consent. consent. Yeah, so, so, you know, that's, that's sort of a historical origin of the thing, both in practice and in theory. Around the time of the Glorious Revolution, Shaftesbury, Locke working as a, a kind of a secretary for a very powerful liberal, kind of, a Whig, but a kind of a early proto-liberal, and writing this all out as the treatise. It's, it's developed. It's changed a lot, a lot since oh, then. Indeed. <laughs> um, but that's, that's fascinating. One of the criticisms that is often made of liberalism, and I think you've you found it in, in the, some of the politics of getting the Ramsey Centre's courses in universities, <laughs> is that while you talk about all men and people equal, in fact, it's been blind to race or colonial power, um, and that it, 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 it's, it's, well, rather, it has been blind in the past to these inequalities. Do you think that's a fair criticism uh, no, I don't really. I think liberalism has always been very open to the possibility that equality isn't yet fully articulated. I mean, it was it was the origin. It was Locke's original insight that equality was the basis of a fair, a political um, um, practice, and it was more a matter of, uh, as you said, of a progressive over the next hundred years expanding of the notion of equality to include, obviously, you know, vindication of the rights of women, Mill's, Mill's attitude to the franchise, the extending of the franchise right the way through the 19th century. So Locke opened the door, and even though he might not have explicitly argued for, let's say, you know, since you mentioned gender, he might not have explicitly argued for the equality of men and women, he left that open. I mean, Locke says quite interestingly somewhere in the, in the treatise that um, that men are not set to rule over women, but that human beings are set to rule over the animal kingdom. So he's already chipped away at the ancient patriarchal idea that men are the rulers and women are the subjects. He just opens the door a bit. And then, of course, you've got all the, all the stuff that happens in the 19th, 19th century, which opens it even further. So I don't, I just, know, don't really buy I, it. Yeah. But I was just drawing attention, perhaps it's more the hypocrisy of, or the blindness of, of liberals at certain times. I mean, the, the most obvious one is the Declaration of American Independence yep. Uh, yep. and the actual practice of, the, of those who wrote it. It's, uh, yes. That they could not see that or maybe saw it and hid it is, from our enlightened 21st century view, yeah. astounding. Sure. Look, I mean, uh, it's, it's a long time since I've read the, the Declaration, but I'm pretty sure I came across a comment that Jefferson, 
thought that the idea that everybody was created equal actually was directly opposed to slavery. In other words, Jefferson Jefferson was by no means kind of blind to the, 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 the potential hypocrisy in the drafting of the document. But of course, I mean, as many people said, including maybe Thomas Paine, can't remember, uh, you know, it's, it's a glaring inconsistency to say that on the one hand and to have people who own plantations on the other hand. But again, it opened the door to what eventually was to become abolitionism and emancipation and, and so on. Why has liberalism not gained more support given its, on the face of it, extremely attractive credentials of being opposed to despotism and human liberty? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, in a way, one answer to that is that liberalism has gained enormous support because it's, it's, it's essentially appealed via all those other historical channels to all of contemporary political constitutions. Um, if you think of how those original Lockean doctrines of freedom and equality and consent got propagated and kind of distributed through Rousseau, uh, the French Enlightenment, and then through the French Revolution into the Declaration of the Rights of Man, et cetera, which, and all the subsequent liberal mm. revolutions of the 19th century, it's a doctrine of huge, yes. not even just a doctrine, but it's hugely influential uh, right through into the 20th century. So, and Locke, you know, it's easy to forget he was 100 years before the French Revolution and he was already saying it. So it actually, in, a, in that sense, it's, it's enormously popular. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of underlying underpinning of um, all the new constitutions of South America and the developing world in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Uh, in some ways, it's also been, it's underpinned certain kinds of nationalism, um, the idea of a state as being autonomous from, from outside uh, um, um, Empire. impediments yeah. to its, yeah, it, exactly, imperialism. So it's, um, it's actually very, very popular. I mean, let's put it another way around. This is, this is something that interests me because I think um, liberalism, as you've implied, does get clobbered from both the left and the right um, um, nowadays. I mean, I was... It's, it's the problem of being in the middle, I suspect. It's the, it's, it's the <laughs> centrist. I mean, the, one thing that absolutely kind of, I was falling about, like probably like you were, a lot of people, um, um, Vladimir Putin, uh, his comment recently that the liberal idea has become obsolete. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it has for you, Mr. Putin, but I don't think it's become obsolete full stop. It's just an extraordinary thing for him to have said. But liberalism gets criticised on the one hand by, you know, by um, um, points of view, political positions that are to its left, even more progressivist than it is. And that would usually be on the grounds that liberalism has become kind of an apologetics for capitalism and vested interests and so on, right? So yes, yes, I, yes. That's from one side, but it also gets criticised from the libertarian and more right-wing directions that it's become too basically that it's become too left-wing. It's too progressivist, um, and and uh, uh, it, it basically gives a charter to increased state intervention, which is one strand of liberalism too. Yes, I guess so, one of the one of the challenges of liberalism is, and as one of the other guests on liberalism in question made clear. It's different in different places. It's not a simple thing. Absolutely. Australian liberalism is different from the United States and England and so forth. Well, I mean, let's so, so on that one for a minute, and then I'll come back to what I was going to say about um, why it is that liberalism sometimes gets a bad press, or at least one theory of mine about the, the kind of the weakness of liberalism. Yes, as you say, Rob, completely different. I mean, what, what if, if, if in America somebody says dismissively of somebody else, oh, she's just a liberal, uh, that means something completely different from what a liberal would be in the Australian context or in the British context. Yes. Left and left, almost the point of view, one being on the left and one on the right. It's sort of, it, indeed. I mean, a, a Robert Menzian liberal in Australia would definitely be, even though, you know, even though Menzies said the Liberal Party was to be a progressive Yes. An anti-reactionary party, yes. uh, he still meant something rather more centrist and right of centre than, uh, than, than the word liberal means in the United States in the current context. If you call John Kerry or Susan Rice or somebody a liberal, that would be very different from what Robert Menzies' understanding would have been, and very different again from what William Gladstone's understanding would have been or Asquith's would have been, you know. 
So it's a it's as a as a former guest on your show may have said, it's a broad church. <laughs> Um, That's exactly what he said. No, he was speaking not of liberalism, but of the Liberal Party. Yes. In fact, so. having liberalism and a conservatives minute, which yeah. is another set of interesting issues. So you're quite right about the about the range of things it can mean. You were, you were, I interrupt you. You were talking about yeah. the attack from the left and the right side. No, that's okay. No, so so indeed. So um, so I would say that even if you go right back to the beginning and you trace kind of classical liberalism forward through from Locke through into the 19th century, look at Kantian liberalism and what that's become in the 20th century in the work of John Rawls, and, or even go back a bit to Dewey and sort of um, liberals of that sort. Liberalism's weakness, it seems to me, is the, in a way the, the flip side of its strength, mm. right? And the strength is that its conception of the person, the human person, the self, is quite an abstract one. It's, it's, as they say in philosophy, it's a punctual conception of the self as something that's a kind of a choice, a point of choosing or willing. It's quite abstract. So as long as we've got these notions of freedom uh, and of consent, uh, um, those are, between them, they don't actually add up freedom, equality and consent, I should say. They give us a picture of a choosing self with no other affiliations. I was going to ask, yes. And, yes, and, I see and, that point exactly. That's yeah, really and, and, and even, when you, even when you come on to John Stuart Mill, who's the other kind of classical uh, formulation of the doctrine of liberalism in his, in his essay, um, uh, you know, that the harm principle, that the only key thing that, a, that a, um, uh, a state should ensure is that nobody actually harms anybody else. It's a very, very minimal conception of a Can, self. Can I, uh, uh, I, I, want, I want to explore this. I think, I think you've, you've touched on a very important issue. I want to ask in a minute about history and, and morality, but just staying with harm for a moment. Yeah. I think it was Walid Ali in a piece I read recently draws attention that the cancel culture's mm. you know, I mean the, um, concern is harm has now become the, mm. the in, in a world we've thinned out morality, yeah, yeah. The one thing we can say is that's ha that that harms me. I'm harmed. It's all we've got left. Yeah. And and he drew attention. I hadn't thought of this. That actually comes from Mill. Yeah, indeed. Oh, of course it does. No, I mean, I it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually called it's called the harm principle, and it's the almost the the, the first thing that. Um, but it's now I, doing it's now doing massive amount of work. Yeah, it, it's, to cover closing things down, shutting people up, um, all sorts of laws, all being invoked. Um, yeah. So the harm principle has gone feral, if I could put it that way. So, so Mill is really fascinating. And if I were um, to suggest to, you know, an undergraduate class or something, one, one short extract to read on modern liberalism, it would be the first chapter of On Liberty. Because not only he, what he says, I, I, I actually got it out, Rob. I must have you. added your Thank question. You. Thank you. Um, he says... Um, the object of this essay, and it's a really influential essay, this one, is to assert one very simple principle. The sole end for which mankind are warranted in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So it's absolutely kind of front and centre, the whole doctrine of essentially of liberalism in Mill is all about harm. And, it, and, and as, as I was saying a minute ago, and, and so are you, it's a very kind of one-dimensional concept. And, often, and therefore often forced to do work that it can't Absolutely. do. Absolutely. That, that is exactly Which leads right. to my next question. Does, I mean, can liberalism really be effective in human flourishing without morality? Okay, now that's, that's actually where I was going with the rest of the thought about this, the abstraction of liberalism. Because in both Locke and Mill, you have a concept which actually is very, very abstract. Um, it's, it, it's, it's almost anemic yes. in a way. Uh, and so when uh, a, a political position, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, liberal politicians are anemic. <laughs> um, well. but, but, but there's something about the underlying kind of conceptual structure of the philosophy that's very thin. Right. Mm. And I think quite a lot of contemporary um, political philosophers like Michael Sandel, for example, or Alistair McIntyre say this. Um, essentially, what they're saying is that if you confront uh, almost like a kind of skeletal conceptual structure like this with 
various kind of red-blooded, um, uh, really kind of angry sets of religious or nationalist or ideological values, including class and gender and race and things that get people really worked up. Um, but even more, I guess, with deep old religious affiliations or nationalist affiliations, it tends, liberalism tends to lose out because when people are speaking viscerally, kind of from the gut or from the heart, it, 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 it doesn't have a lot to say except, oh, let's not harm each other or, you know, let's protect freedom or, you know, only government by consent. And those are values that everybody can agree on. And in fact, they have all over the world. Um, but at the same time, when they're confronted with a really kind of, um, uh, you know, a full-blooded, deep value, so, so it's, they, tend, they tend to cave. So its anthropology is, is, is in effect, inadequate. Its view of humanity. Or, or else, rather than saying that, it's never meant to be the only game of the town. That's it's, right. it's not, it's, it's not to be the one again hegemonic worldview, that, uh, right. but, but perhaps a flavour, perhaps a adding to other things. Would that be a better way to approach it? Yeah, or, or at least maybe to create, forgive the word, a civilised structure within which these differences of value can be, can be fought out. I mean, in a way, that's the point of pluralism, as understood by, you know, theorists like Isaiah Berlin in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, liberalism can work very well in that way as a framework. As, as it's an architecture, okay, yes. um, which is what was intended in the post-war settlement of the, of the rule of law in the WTO and the UN and all these international organisations that are now tottering in many ways. I mean, the WTO is kind of almost on its last legs, which is very sad because if liberalism is nothing else, it's the staunchest and oldest defender of free trade. Yes. Something, something yes. worth mentioning. I mean, the, 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 the rise of the Liberal Party coincided, coincided with the defeat of the Corn Laws in, in uh, earlier 19th century England, and it's a great triumph mm. because protectionism is a beast for ordinary consumers and that always has been. So it's ironic that the WTO and other of these agencies are now um, really under threat. I have to say, Rob, from China more than, more, more than anything else, from, from illiberal um, regimes which have white anted and undermined its its effectiveness. At least that's that's how that's how I see it. Anyway, so so um so basically, I mean, just to complete the thought that you've had, Lockean liberalism tends to ignore its own more visceral roots, which were in English constitutional practice on the one hand, and in Christianity. On yes, the I'm other. going to ask that. It, there's a rule you can argue. I I believe, and some guests have. That liberalism can only arise in a culturally, without making theological claims, the culturally Christian context, because it has certain views about human human beings, their, their equality and dignity, which it draws upon but cannot self defend because liberalism is, is it's, it cannot uh, it can't be a complete system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Complete system. Yep. Now, uh, can I ask a difficult question? Um, Western civilization liberalism is a mark of Western civilization. Hmm. Is it contingent upon Western civilization, or can it have a life beyond that? Is 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 it a particular way, or is it effect is in it, as it wants to believe it is, in principle universal? Well, universalism. I think it was John Gray who wrote about this. He was trying to list what the the the, the, the key um, the key markers of liberalism are, and universalism was one of the ones that he mentioned. Yes. Uh, individualism, I think, was another yes, one. Yes. Um, uh, I, I can't remember them all. There were four, but but so so it certainly does in practice have pretensions to universalism. But the the the, the concepts which it advocates are very very hard to argue with. I mean, if you're actually going to say um, it is not the case that all people are created equal and free. Um, in other words, if you're going to contradict liberalism on those grounds, it's very hard what, to find out, to figure out what you're going to say instead. So, so it's, um, it's still, in that sense, very, very strong. But um, it's, as you say, it's rejected along with universalism on the grounds that this is actually an attempt by the West to export its values to the rest of the world. Um, well, it, it, well, it's certainly that, but whether it's that with good faith or bad faith, perhaps is the uh, yeah. because it, it, it arises in a Western Protestant culture. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think it's an interesting question whether whether 
it can it, it can genuinely thrive, not in that. This leads to an issue which is relevant. Um, I'll just say, Rob, can I just interrupt? I, 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 never, um, I never pass up a chance to wave a bit of a banner for Hong Kong. And I think... Uh, Please I, do so. You, you were there for some time. Yeah, there for nine years. And I think this is a very good example of uh, essentially a Chinese culture in which um, yes. liberalism has flourished. That's a very good point. Uh, sadly, so, sadly to be yeah. well, crushed by other forces, but not, sadly, but not, but not from within. Not from within, indeed, Not from indeed, within. from from outside. So I just mentioned that as a as a partial answer. Yeah. Um, around this time, we're thinking a lot about the vexed question of the liberal the liberal society and indigenous rights. Everyone can sense an interesting concept at the centre of liberalism, even if we. I think it's over, overstated. We are often born into relationships. We don't just consent to them. <laughs> we are born into obligations. We don't yes. just consent to having my yes. parents or my children. Yes, yes. Okay. So which, is, a, which, I, is, which is a classic conservative criticism yes. of liberalism. I think I must be a classic conservative critic of liberalism at this yeah. point. <laughs> um, but there's a sense in which coming to Australia, all of us have a sense implicitly consented by coming. There were those we, to whom liberalism didn't, it was imposed upon them, if I could put it that way, or come upon them. I'm interested in your thoughts. Can a liberal state find a place for the peculiar nature of Indigenous rights? I'm thinking of both land rights and the some of the, the, the things that the Uru Statement of the Heart would like to have. Many liberals oppose these on the grounds they're not treating people equally. Do you have any thoughts on this matter at all, Paul? Rob, um, it's a difficult one. I, I think... Let's let's take a let's take a step back. There are two there are two um, uh, uh, theories or two principal approaches to liberty that theorists of the twentieth century identified, including Berlin. I mentioned yes. a minute ago, and he calls them positive and negative conceptions of liberty. And the negative conception basically is an idea of liberty that says you must remove constraints from people. Uh, so. Um, uh, that, that, and it's very, uh, quite a thin conception. Yes. You must actually not prevent people from seeking life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But then the positive conception is that you must actually do things as a government and as a society which will enable people to fulfil and develop themselves. Uh, and so, for example, the welfare state was a response to the view that you can't just take government out of the picture, you have to put government back into the picture to make it possible for poor people to have enough well-being because they're, you know, they're, they've got enough resources. To so make you, them free, as it were. It, it, in a sense, make them free, although yeah. maybe without that Rousseauian... Yes, I know. Yes, I'm sorry. That, there's, a dark being, story, there's a dark story there. It's, no, no, no. Well, you know, the, the Rousseau thing about being forced to be free has always made me slightly kind of... And I think we saw some terrible... I mean, yes... Yeah, very unequal. The, the terror that arose out of the liberal revolution of the French Revolution is always yeah. to be a warning about the horrors yeah. of perfectionism and, uh, well, and that, You're dead right. I mean, I think that's a very good point. So, so if you, so you know, just being very kind of um, moderate about all of this, if you just were to say that the same thing could be applied to the indigenous communities in Australia, in other words, this is something where society has a responsibility to enable them to be fulfilled and to live to the best of their ability, whatever way that may be, that will be very consistent with the doctrine of, with the positive doctrine of liberalism as it's been articulated over the last 150 years. Uh, my guest is Simon Haynes. This is a liberalism question. We're unfortunately coming towards the end of our time. Uh, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the future of liberalism? Do you, do you think it's got a, a, a glorious future or is it going to be a faded philosophy of the past? I, well, I'm not look, what you want to happen. I thought, what do you think will happen? There are different yes, well, <laughs> oh, gosh, you know, okay, I'd make a lot of money if, if, if I knew the answer to that. Um, it's been around, even if you just go as far back as Locke, so that's what, 17, 18, 19, that's 300 years, um, nearly 350 years, and it's still flourishing. Uh, it's still, those, those basic doctrines are still ones that receive more or less universal assent. I think the risk to liberalism going forward is actually, as it's always been, the, the, the existence of absolutism of all sorts and all, all kinds, which is what Locke started out by resisting. Absolutism from within our societies and absolutism outside in places that I needn't, I needn't, uh, I needn't be any clearer about than that we've mentioned a couple. 
Uh, and I think liberalism has a strong future as a, as, a, as a resistance to absolutism. Its weakness, as I mentioned to you, is that it doesn't recognise that it itself draws on very powerful, deep values that maybe it needs to return to, 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 re, to re, refurbish itself. But no, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic, Rob. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> My guest has been Professor Simon Haynes, the CEO of the Randy Centre for Western Civilization. This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening. Thank you.